morning. It's 10 a.m. on Tuesday, November 24th, 2020, and this is 10 on Tuesdays. Today we have Wisconsin Representative John Mako, and we're going to talk a little bit about sales tax simplification. As I told John, I said it's a, a breezy half an hour discussion about tax. No big deal. Um, I'm Holly Hoffman, owner of Sales and Income Tax Advisory Network. Prior to creating my company, I worked for the Wisconsin Department of Revenue as an auditor, speaker, and sales tax specialist. My passion is to help provide sales tax education and support to tax professionals, businesses, and associations with the goal of building a network of empowered taxpayers. For more information, visit salesandincometax.com. And thank you for joining my web chats, 10 on Tuesdays, every Tuesday from 10 to 10.30 a.m. You can check out previous episodes on my 10 on Tuesdays channel. To find my channel, go to salesandincometax.com, look for the 10 on Tuesdays logo and click the logo to register or click on watch previous episodes to access the 10 on Tuesdays channel. So with that, I am introducing you to Representative John Mako. I'm sure everyone's familiar with him. Wisconsin Assembly District 88, and he's very knowledgeable on tax policies and um, a lot of things. Um, he's the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, which is a very powerful committee. And um, looking at your list of current committees, you have a lot of experience, but you had a life prior to politics and you own your own business. Um, I want you to share a little bit about your background because you don't, sure. You aren't just a politician, you have a background in business. No, that's absolutely right. And I look at all those assignments, it's no wonder I'm tired. Um, and I can, <laughs> assure, I can assure you, uh, we're gonna par that down this time around. I'm very proud that we turned the Ways and Means Committee. Part of my, just going back to the evolution, like you said, I mean, I, I was like many of your listeners, uh, a business person in the state of Wisconsin. We created several businesses. We started from scratch. If you uh, uh, go to my website, uh, uh, johnmarco.com, uh, and then just backslash or forward slash about, and you can read stories that are probably very, very similar to the organizations of many of your listeners, where we literally started from scratch. We had eight people living in a little house. Mom was making uh, a gallon of powdered milk and mixing it with regular milk so we wouldn't taste the chalkiness. Um, I've literally been working since I was 12. I was always bigger, bigger for my size so I could lie and say I was 13. Um, and I uh, have literally worked uh, since I was 12. I'm now 62, so that's 50 years and I've not stopped. Um, and so I, I think when you believe in, people say you must have always wanted to be in politics, and I'm saying, well, no, I don't even know that I need to do it now, but um, if you believe in stewardship and contributing back to your community, and I always say, Holly, that uh, some people say, well, we've inherited this community uh, from our grandparents, and I don't believe that. I think when you when you inherit something, then you you take ownership, then you think it's yours. I think we're borrowing it from our grandchildren, and which means it's just a stewardship responsibility. And it was that um, that caused me to get involved. And so, you know, when you're involved with the the Boy Scouts Christmas tree sale and the old Main Street Committee and the bid board and some of the other things, and all of a sudden they come to you and they say, "Hey, uh, would you run for this office?" And so I did that under the stipulation that I would be able to actually get something done. I mean, people go to they, they go into politics for one of two reasons, either they, because they want to be somebody or they want to do something. Well, you know, we already have trucks with, uh, you know, there's 100 trucks driving around the state and a dozen buildings with my name on it. I don't need to be anybody. Um, so I really wanted to get some stuff done. So I approached the speaker and I said, look, tax policy really needs to originate from the people's house. Uh, that has not happened in the past and we need to make our Ways and Means Committee as close to the Federal Ways and Means Committee as we possibly could, and he agreed with that. And so that's been our charge for the last five and a half years. We are now the one of the, if not the, the one of the busiest uh, uh, committees, standing committees in the assembly. We cleared 76 bills last session. Many committees only get a dozen. Um, so we actually had 76 of that, 24 of those passed, uh, and 19 of the 24 were fully unanimous. So we've done a phenomenal job, I think, of simplifying the tax policy for your clients and your advisors. And we can talk a little bit more about that as we move along. So it's a very tough job that you have. And um, I've I've worked, well, now I'm on the, the 
private side and I work closely on the administrative side for Wisconsin Department of Revenue. And when yep. I worked at Revenue, I worked with Tom Moreda, who also um, had represented my area when I was growing up, even though he didn't seem like an older man. He, um, <laughs> it was fun working with him. And I would always say when tax policy get passed, because at DOR, one of the things we did was reviewed legislative language and identified and gave feedback if it was administrable. And administrable doesn't mean it's very workable for the taxpayer, it's just whether or not we can administer it um, effectively without much cost. And I'd always turn to Tom Areta and be like, what, <laughs> what were they thinking when they passed this? But um, one of the things I did when I was out speaking is tried to explain, like, um, to be specific, we have the building materials exemption, oh. which is an exemption that contractors asked for. And just to give a little background, the point was to, when you do a contract with an exempt entity, if the exempt entity can purchase materials exempt, allow the contractor to purchase exempt. And one of the things I would have to explain is when the legislature was reviewing that um, tax proposal, um, how did it impact fiscally? Um, who does it impact? And then the other thing people don't see is um, sometimes you create policy for a certain reason and it has unintended consequences that ripple throughout <laughs> the tax code. So. Could you talk a little bit from your side how complex that is and how how do you how do you deal with that on your side? Well, you're absolutely right. And the, the best way I, I people need to understand, first of all, if the state of Wisconsin is a a, a hundred billion dollar a day, excuse me, a hundred million dollar a day entity. Now, just to get some idea of how massive that is, and as you know, Holly, every single department is a multi-billion dollar organization. So it's like running a Fortune 500 company, each department. And so $100 million a day to put into perspective, the city of Green Bay functions on $105 million for the whole year. The University of Wisconsin Green Bay, which is in my district, functions on $97 million a, a year. We burn through that in a single day. So it's massive and it's bizarrely complicated. And so you and I could sit and talk about inverted yield curves and price earnings ratios, and we might find that really fun, but I'm not sure a lot of your <laughs> listeners would. Um, so what I like to say is this, I said the tax code is so messed up. When you just look at food, for example, uh, yogurt is tax exempt and raisins are tax exempt, but yogurt covered raisins are taxable and honey is tax exempt and roasted nuts are tax exempt but honey roasted nuts are taxable. And we can't even agree on what candy is because a Kit Kat candy bar is tax exempt, but M&Ms are taxable. And the tip of the tax iceberg is literally ice. We have an entire page on how to tax ice in the code. I was with yeah. some contractors with Associated Builders and Contractors just this past Friday. And one of the problems they have is, although we did a good job with that, you're absolutely right, um, and the, and the, when we looked at that exemption, that materials exemption, the issue was there was a way around it. Few people mm -hmm. were paying it anyway, because what we would do, like when I headed up our church building program, the church bought the materials and then just parked them at the, in, you know, on, on behalf of the contractor. And so we weren't collecting much from that anyway. So the fiscal impact was nothing and, and people figured a way around it. So we're going, well, why don't we make that easier? One thing I found out just on Friday, if you have a camera, if you have security cameras in your building and it's watching, and I don't even remember anymore, but if it's watching stuff, it's yes. taxed one way. And if it's watching people, it's a different tax policy. Or if you have um, cabling, uh, let's say you're putting in a, uh, a bank uh, drive up window and it runs up and over the top and down, it's at, at one price, it, it's one tax thing. And if the, But if the cabling goes, uh, underground, then it's another thing. And and so it, it's so bizarrely complicated, um, <laughs> as, as you know. And, and and so I think we've got to figure a way to make it simple, fair, uh, and low. And we've been doing that the last five or six years. We've made really quite tremendous progress. 
Yeah, I laugh because everything you're talking about are rulings that I had to do in the last four years when I was at DOR, um, sure. <laughs> the cabling. And and I did research to change um, data cabling in commercial right. facilities to try to make that real property, but it's not like electrical and there's so much tangible personal property dispersed. So what you're saying is that's it's exactly it. Yeah, it's complicated. It's not simple like you would if think. People need to know the de delineation. So what they're saying, what she just said is that the cabling, if you have data cabling and it's in the wall, drywalled in, all encased in the wall, it's still not considered part of the building. It's yours and it's taxed at a different, it's it's covered under personal property tax on a, on an income tax, on a uh, property tax basis. And then the sales tax. So it's, it's absolutely bizarre. Like, what am I going to do when I leave? I'm going to rip it out of the wall. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it needs to continue to be uh, streamlined. And I think and it's come. I think it's okay. because you've had, it's like you said, when you look at some of these legislators and God bless them all, you know, mm -hmm. but I think you have to be accretive to the process. Government in and of itself has no brain. Government in and of itself doesn't do anything or have any character. Or anything. It is made up of the body of people that are there. And so if you're bringing something to the discussion, it's, it should be accretive. And I think that's the way our founding fathers had it. I mean, uh, you know, John Adams had skill sets that he brought to the organization and left them there. I think there's certain folks, there's, there's myself, there's uh, uh, Shannon Zimmerman, there's Terry Kotzma, there's uh, other great folks that came in. We're just, we're losing uh, Mike Rorcast. He was the head of all of HR for uh, Oshkosh Truck Globally. And to have his knowledge when it came not to tax policy, but to HR type issues was phenomenal for the citizens of the state of Wisconsin. And so uh, I think that's what we need is more folks when it comes to tax and finance, not for everything, but when it comes to tax and finance, people that assign the front of the check are the guys that ought to be there. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that the speaker is allowing us to do that. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it would be nice if I could just give you some like, hey, you should pass this and this will fix everything. And, you know, at DOR, we had the opportunity to write proposals and and I wrote one to simplify <laughs> contractor sales and use tax law. And it got really long because there's so many tangly things interconnected and definitions that my boss, Nate, was like, um, yeah, we can't even explain this. <laughs> right. So um, it does get complex. And, and that's my question. We have a couple things that complicate sales tax law. And I love being a part of Streamline, but Streamline has some predetermined definitions that we have to confine, uh, you know, um, abide by. And you talk about candy, and that's one of them. That's a Streamline thing. Um, there are some switches of taxable or non-taxable, and I think we could fix those in our tax code for contractors. That's the whole data cabling and things like that. But um, I'm wondering if, you know, we want to broaden the tax base. And when I've been talking to contractors, and that's what I've done for the past 10 years, is speak to contractors and teach them sales tax law and how to comply. But the thing is, is they are willing to pay a little more i'm not saying they have deep pockets i'm just saying the cost of paying a little more in tax to make it broader based and not so complicated with exemptions and and this and that would be offset by the amount of money they currently have to pay to hire people to help them comply and the other issue is is I know there's get arounds for some of the stuff like we were talking about the um, building materials exemption, the contracts with exempt entities, stuff like that. But there's a difference between small contractors and large contractors. Large contractors have the capability to create separate entities for purchasing and things like that. Small contractors don't. They just don't have the capacity or the money to have separate entities and pay someone to to account for that. And so there, there's complicating factors. Exemptions are great for large entities and 
more burdensome on small contractors. And I'm just wondering, I know part of your solution, and I 100% am on board with it, is broaden the tax pay base and make it more simplified, you know, streamline the exemptions. And, and I think that would help literally everyone, large and small, because I do have large so, contractors so what, as customers. The challenge too. Is, is, I don't care who you are, Republican or Democrat, you are, you're going to, I have had folks in my office and they say, yeah, John, that makes a lot of sense, but we still want our thing. And I say, well, then you're not in my office, you're, you're no value to me. So what we've got to do is we've got to make sure that we understand basic economic principles. Now you sit down with Art Laffer and he's gonna tell you, uh, and if you look at what um, we've tried on several different occasions, when Scott Jensen was the speaker back in 2004 under Tommy Thompson, we took a look at some of this stuff. And so we, what we did before we started in this is we sat down, we talked, we talked to a gentleman by the name of Senator Leon from 1997. I tracked him down at his winter home in Boca someplace. He was shocked. <laughs> Who are you? Why are you calling me? And I said, well, you tried to do this in 97 and it died. How come? And so when you sit and you look at it, it was because they tried to do uh, uh, what we, I think we can do some incremental changes. And so if you were to just take the pure from a purely economic standpoint, if you were to sit down with Laffer and discuss economics, which we I do, um, he will tell you, look, do what we've done here in Tennessee. Just make sales tax on everything nine and a half percent and eliminate income tax. Because what you've got to get to is you've got to get to an understanding. And all of these business owners need to reconcile that is that you got to get to the understanding that you have to that from a purely economic standpoint, if you want to create wealth and you want to uh, create a prosperity in a state, you have to stop taxing wealth creation and tax consumption. So if you take a look at South Dakota, for example, or South Carolina and what they've been doing, um, in South Dakota, by the way, they tax everything, period, everything. And, and so what's the definition of sales tax? If we take a look at sales tax, and you know this, Holly, we generate about five and a half billion dollars annually in sales tax revenue in the state of Wisconsin, five and a half billion. But what do we have for exemptions, Holly? You remember six and a half billion. We collect five and a half billion and we have six and a half billion dollars worth of exemptions. We even have exemptions on clay pigeons for some ungodly reason. I didn't even know we had a clay <laughs> pigeon lobby. And so what you have to do is you have to have uh, business owners that are not intellectually lazy and will actually calculate the cost associated with that and look and say, well, now, wait a minute. If you offset taxing consumption with, uh, by not taxing property, by not taxing, uh, you know, PPT for those of your people who don't understand what that is. That's a that's a boondoggle. Um, yeah. First personal property tax, um, and then and and it's certainly income tax. Now we've been successful in doing that, and I hope we get into some of those things before our time runs out. Um, you know, we've actually dropped the first two brackets. The the four percent bracket is now about three and a half, and the second one is also down about fifty basis points because of sound fiscal policy that we've done uh, starting in our house and moved through the the, the system. So. When you sit and you take a look at what the economy is doing and why the state of Wisconsin is such fantastic shape right now, it's because we have been putting downward pressure on property tax and income tax, and that would really accelerate if we were to do that. So you've got to get these business owners to say, hey, sure, if, if all of this stuff was sales taxable, but your income tax went to this, now what would that look like? And if they're honest, if they're being intellectually honest, they would look at that and go, oh, that does make a lot of sense. And that may be a hard lift to get there, but I think, you know, we'll eat this elephant one bite at a time and just continue to plug along on certain things. And are we going to continue to do that um, with the offset at the same time and stages? Absolutely. Or... Okay. It, ab absolutely. it has to be. It has to be a zero sum uh, budget process. You have to be trading. You have to be trading. And what you alluded to before to, for the audience is something we call dynamic scoring. And so government is the goofiest thing I've ever seen. You know, they'll say, well, if we uh, need to double our revenue, let's say we sell this chair right here for $100 and we sell 10 of them, but we need more money than that. So what we're going to do is raise the price of that chair to $200 and we'll double our money. Well, Everybody knows that's not true. Why? Because we're now going to sell less chairs. So instead of selling 10 chairs, we only sell five chairs at $200. We still have the same amount of revenue. So we don't have the ability to enter in that dynamic scoring component. So we want to keep it flat now. 
the University of Wisconsin-Madison does. Dr. Williams over there is their econo economist, and he's got a new software program that he's been working on. So he can take all of that basic data that Bob Lang at the Le Legislative Fiscal Bureau will create, and then with a button he hits and boom, it'll add in the dynamic scoring component of those things. So it, we have to keep it even. We have, to, we, I don't want to, I will not raise taxes. And one good example of that, as you recall, um, in addition to all those committee assignments, committee assignments that you listed before i also chair the salt task force and the budget and revenue task force for the national council of state legislators it was our committee over the last five years that pushed the wayfair internet tax thing through this the south dakota supreme court and all the way to the u.s supreme court and got that overturned but we knew dale Quang, the senator dale Quang, and i knew that hey wait a minute we don't want that that's we aren't sure there's no way i knew that was going to be 250 million dollars this year I didn't, I'd like to tell you I did, but I didn't. But we knew it would be something. And so what we wanted to do is to make sure that that was not a net increase in taxes to the taxpayers of the state of Wisconsin. And so that has been used to offset those first two brackets. And that's how we went from 4%. It's just, it's statutorily in there now, the revenue from that internet sales piece has to be offset on the first two brackets, not the top two brackets. I wish we could do something with that and corporate rates. I, we need to talk, take a look at that. Um, but um, that that money was used to offset that. So to your point is yes, that has to be a zero sum game and there is plenty of, of, of cash to do that so that we're not increasing the tax burden on people. And maybe that's a better answer to how do we get business owners to go along with it? Because they yes. have to recognize that, hey, wait a minute, this is going to uh, be a, a net zero. We're not, this is not a money grab. This is just putting smart economics into your point. It, it, this is the way I say it. I, I looked at, when I first looked at that tax code, I'm going, this doesn't even look like anybody designed it on purpose. Can we please yeah. get to a tax code that looks like someone designed it on purpose? So we get to that and we put quality economic principles in place, it should be a zero sum game. But what you'll see then is that dynamic scoring component go as the economy is loosened. And we're seeing some of that already. And I'll, I can talk to you about some of those forward looking assumptions that I got from Bob Lang just this morning. I was just thinking as you were talking and is there any push to maybe get some of the changes we would want broadening the base and things like that? Uh, sure. Pushing it through streamline, getting streamline on board, or getting other states on board, or are well, that's a little frustrating. Again, they have a vested interest across the board to do their thing, and they want yeah. membership. So the, those folks and I, as you know, go head to head all the time. I don't agree with a lot of what streamline does. Um, I, I get it, but it's to me, it's a misnomer. The name of the thing is a misnomer and so right. their big argument is and i argued this we had a, a, a ncsl a chair to and i chaired an ncsl zoom meeting just last week on that and the problem with streamline is is they will argue that oh you but keep in mind we want to broaden the base but don't tax manufacturing inputs well the problem with those guys is is they consider the coffee that you consume for your staff as a manufacturing input and so that's just nonsense um, we're not talking about taxing the, the wheat and the sugar that goes into making the bread or in manufacturing. We're not talking about taxing the, the steel and some of it to your point with, uh, with, um, construction products, because yep. it's all taxed, it's all taxed at the end. But are you telling me that an accounting report, which has zero value to anybody else, it is literally consumed. If that business does, a a, a, a services they get some services done that that shouldn't be a taxable thing. And here's what's happening. At one point, most of that stuff was taxable. I'm old enough to remember when you would go and buy, and I still have my turntable upstairs because I'm kind of an officiate, uh, you know, I kind of uh, an audiophile. I like albums. And so you would go to the store, you would pay $12.95 for your album and pay tax on it, come home and use it. That law hasn't changed. That's still on the books, but we don't tax music. Why? Not because we changed the law, not because we made an exemption to it, but because the distribution channel changed. That is not sufficient reason to all of a sudden get an exemption. And software was exactly the same way. Um, 
yes. you know, again, Microsoft wasn't a company when we started our company back in 1976. By 1980, it, you know, we, they started to come around, but we had to write and create our own software. And we would go down and buy some software. So we'd buy a package for uh, payroll or whatever it is. You'd literally buy a box, a box of software and you would, again, pay $19.95 or whatever it was worth at the time, probably $100. And, and then pay the sales tax, come in and install it on your machine. That law hasn't changed either. And yet that's somehow all exempt now because of the distribution channel that has taken place. That's never been intended. Those are still final purchase consumption items that are consumed and should fall under the sales tax consumption um, definition. Or we got to define the, the thing. Now, I can make, you know, there are going to be some things politically that you can't do. You could make that same argument with grandma's insulin that that's a that's a taxable consumed product but that's going to be a very tough uh, pill to swallow so i'm not saying you get rid of all of those exemptions but what i would do is i would start with that premise no exemptions and then start adding a few back in rather than saying here's where we are and taking some out um and, and also by the way on the insulin thing we're the government's paying for half of it already anyway so um you know we would want to make sure that uh that that would be included in the exemptions. Right. Oh my gosh, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> I know, when, that, and, yeah. and when they said, you know, do you need notes? And they go, no, John isn't gonna need notes. No, no. Um, I didn't even talk about half the stuff I wanted to talk about. It's just it's just interesting and I'm, I'm glad we got I, to I focus on tax. I want to be able to make sure that everybody understands how well the state of Wisconsin is doing. We finished our June fiscal 30th report finished with 1.172, almost $1.2 billion ahead. We have $762 million in our rainy day fund and our revised projections that just came out a couple of weeks ago show that we will end June 2021, next June, about seven months from now, again with about a $1.2 billion um, general fund balance. That is staggering. We are. N it doesn't look like we'll be short at all. So if this budget, um, and so it seems to me that we are in profoundly good shape. A lot of that had to do with the, and that doesn't happen by accident. When uh, the feds put in TICCHA, their tax plan, many, many corporations in the state of Wisconsin switched. They, they made the election that we will, we will switch our corporate entity and we'll pay at the corporate rate of 7.9 here in the state of Wisconsin. That's a little more than they would have paid, but we're gonna switch that anyway. And we'd rather pay the corporate rate than the personal rate, even though it's higher, to switch off so that we don't have to pay as high a rate on the feds. And we are seeing corporate revenues just go through the roof. DOR has also done an amazing job. I got a call in for Peter, and while we were on this call, he texted me back. So Secretary Barca, I've just got to find out. Um, they had several audits that have generated tons of money, one $100 million, another $87 million. We already talked about the sales tax piece that has brought in over $250 million of excess cash that we weren't expecting. And so those are all being used to balance our budget, to keep us on the, on the straight and narrow, things that I can assure you that very few, if any, states can talk about. Now, Main Street businesses are being hurt badly, uh, but the paradigm shift has uh, shifted, and that would be another great show, Holly, is to talk about what that means um, for the future. Well, since our budget is in such great shape, that means that businesses can uh, maybe have a sigh of relief. We were all anticipating um, increased audit actions and possible tax increases due to the coronavirus this year. Um, do you not see that as being necessary? I can assure you there will not be a tax increase that would ever pass my committee or our house, period. That's a fact. Now, I don't want to do, for those of you that are old enough to remember the Bush comment, read my <laughs> lips, no new taxes, uh, but I will tell you I would be a definite no, especially when we look at what we've got here. Again, keep in mind a biennium, we're an $82 billion organization. So I suspect that the governor, keep in mind in his last budget, he wanted to spend $2 billion above what we already had in there. We said no to that. Thank goodness. Again, this type of tax policy, the condition of the state of Wisconsin does not happen by accident. 
These were very, very deliberate. If you look at the CAFR, what we've done in the Consolidated Annual Financial Report and what we've done on all of these tax pieces over the last 10 years, from the $79 million we took off of the property tax on the uh, 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 Forestry mill tax is gone on what we've done in personal property tax to reduce that is down now under $300 million. We continue to shrink uh, some of those things. We paid off a billion dollars of debt, saving $4 million a week in interest. That's $200 million a year alone, just in interest because of prudent budgeting. And I'll be darned if I will let this administration get us back into that mess. So as long as we stay within our revenues, which every house in the, in the state of Wisconsin does, we're going to be fine. But if he comes in and says, well, even though we're going to have an extra billion dollars more than we had last year, I want to spend an extra three billion dollars. That is not going to happen. We will go. We will go to base again and just start over. Keep in mind, his budget was 1,200 pages. Ours was 511. So there was 511 pages worth of stuff we could agree on, and 700 pages of stuff we could not agree on. That's not going to change. Mm. Well, I wish you the best of luck, and I hope you come back on because I would definitely love to talk more about the economy. I did have that on our. Uh, agenda for today but just so much to talk about yeah. with you so thank yeah, you yeah, for joining fine. me yep thanks for having me next tuesday join me for updates and notes december 8th we have dan mcginnity of mcginnity and associates he's going to provide some insight into commercial real estate industry and marketing and for those of you interested in multi-state tax issues craig johnson the executive director of streamlined sales tax Governing Board it will be returning on December 15th, and he has some news to share with us. And to rewatch this episode or to view previous episodes of 10 on Tuesdays, go to salesandincometax.com and check out my 10 on Tuesdays channel. Have a happy and healthy Thanksgiving, John, to you and your family and everyone out there listening, and I will see you all next week. Thank you. I am.